Hello and welcome to The Cutting Room, the movie show from All The Right Movies. I'm John and with me today it's our very own Jack and Rose. It's Westy. Hello, not Rose West. <laughs> and Matt... <laughs> and Matt. Hello. <laughs> I'll let you both decide which is which. <laughs> well, yeah, we've already decided I that, I think. <laughs> yeah, Jack will be better for me, for just for, yeah, just for legal reasons. Yeah. <laughs> well, today's episode, we're talking one of the biggest commercial successes and biggest Oscars hits of all time. Yeah. We're in the North Atlantic 1912 to talk James Cameron's box office behemoth, Titanic. Yeah. This was your choice, Matt, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> What's that Your mean? wet letters. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it's going to be. Is it okay? Right, fair enough. Okay, as long as I'm on. on the back foot already. Why do you want to talk about it? <laughs> Honestly, people forget what a big deal this film was. Like Marvel or Star Wars film makes a billion dollars now. Where everybody goes, yeah, okay. But yeah. back then, Titanic was the first, and it mm. was a genuine cultural phenomenon. Mm. Everyone went to see it. You had Leo Mania, it swept the Oscars, and it's a great film to talk about because there's some amazing behind-the-scenes stories. And what's also forgotten, so many people had written this film off before the sort, and they thought yeah. Cameron was a lunatic. Mm. A three-hour well. love story on board the Titanic. Well, yeah. <laughs> the most expensive <laughs> film ever made at the time. He, was, he built a scale model of the Titanic to do it. Insane. And I think the backlash started quite quickly, and it's a film people are still a bit sniffy about, but not me. I love it. Always have done. Cool. Good I think for me, of all the big ten poor movies that have came out in my lifetime, I remember Titanic as being the biggest. Right. This is the one where I remember people telling me they'd been to see it like eight or nine times. And that's no surprise. I mean, when it did come out, it was the highest grossing movie ever made. It's still third now, even after 20 odd years of inflation. As for me, I've always had an interest in the real Titanic, a fascinating story. So I was excited for the film when it came out. And at the time, I was actually a bit disappointed to find that, for the most part, the real-life story had been relegated to the background in favour of a fictional love story. Okay. Watching it again now, having not seen it for maybe 15 years, my opinions yeah. on that have changed in some ways. So I'll okay. talk about that as we go. Mm. Yeah. Obviously, it's James Cameron. First thing we've talked about that lunatic on the cutting room <laughs> yeah, yeah. based on a historical tragedy that captured public imagination like few others have an estimated 1517 deaths on the titanic so this should be grim and interesting i think hopefully yeah mm. interesting yeah. Yeah. didn't want a love story what did you want just stats all the way through for three hours <laughs> <laughs> well wesley how's titanic yeah. for you then titanic's great for me i love it and you know what makes it really good it's because it's directed by james cameron Mm. And nobody can say, oh, oh, you like Titanic, do you? Yeah, well, it's directed by the guy who did The Terminator and Aliens <laughs> and Terminator 2. So shut up. So you're allowed to, you're allowed this kind of soft focus on it. It's one of them films where you can actually just go, you know what? He's just stripped all of that away and it's just a great, great film. It's big, it's bold, it's ambitious, it's very James Cameron. And I, yeah, I really enjoy it. So I'm looking forward to talking about it. Okay, great. April 1912 and there's not enough lifeboats. We're diving into Titanic. Seventeen-year-old aristocrat Rose DeWitt Bucata boards the Titanic for its maiden voyage. Looking for escape from her suffocating life, she finds herself caught up in star-crossed love when she meets third-class passenger Jack Dawson. You chopping onions there, Matt? Already? <laughs> I'll be fine, I'll be fine, we'll, we'll get through it. <laughs> Set to the most famous marine disaster in history, Titanic was written and directed by James Cameron, produced and distributed by 20th Century Fox and Paramount Pictures, and stars Kate Winslet as Rose and Leonardo DiCaprio as Jack. Mm -hmm. So, as we usually do on The Cutting Room, we're here to pull the film apart and see what makes it tick or not. We do that by discussing the direction, the writing, the cast, our own individual highlights, and then we'll give the film a rating out of 10, won't we? Mm -hmm. We will. First things first, then, the director of Titanic, we're talking about James Cameron. Hi, I'm Jim. The RMS Titanic was 882 feet and 46,000 tonnes of wrought iron. Who better to direct a film about it, then, than Iron Jim? <laughs> nice. Exactly. 
No stranger to big budgets, James Cameron had directed the most expensive movie ever made twice by this point, Terminator 2 Judgment Day in 1991 and then True Lies in 1994. And with a $200 million budget, Titanic made it number three. Mm-hmm. So, Westy, how did I and Jim do with Titanic? Beautifully spent that $200 million, wasn't it? Yeah. And that's how you spend <laughs> $200 million I'd love to be able to do that. I'd do the same thing. He's, his stamp is all over this. I think it's a very personal project for him. And I think when he was interviewed, he said, I got to go down to see the actual wreck. And that's why I made the film. Yeah. So it was just, you know, it was a real passion project for him. And I think he really nails it. It's a side of him that we're, we haven't seen before. The soft side of Iron Jim. I think the, the way that he moves the camera around is great. And I just love the work that Russell Carpenter brings to this, you know, and he, he actually saying that he wanted to go down to, to visit the real Titanic. Like Mike Cameron, who's his brother, worked with Panavision to develop a deep sea camera that's capable of withstanding 400 atmospheres. I don't know what that is, but that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> it sounds it. <laughs> I would imagine. That's a lot. 400 atmospheres. That's, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, so they worked together with that. But Russell Carpenter trying to, you know, to bring this back to life, it could have been overlit. It could have been, you know, quite cheesy and cartoonish. But I think he just brings a real realistic, grounded element to it. I think everything looks fantastic. I do think the lighting and the camera movements and everything's fantastic because the best films and the best cinematographers make you forget about the camera and you, for one minute, don't realise that there's a camera on the Titanic. Mm. You're on the Titanic. Mm. So I think he does an incredible job of making the camera character and passing the audience through. And I think that was why it was so popular because you're actually teleported there. And that's what James Cameron is so good at doing, world building. Mm. And he builds the world of the Titanic. And you can smell it. You can, you know what they had to eat. You know what the, the crack was like. It was just, it's just really well done. I think anyone else directing it, it could have been an absolute mess. It would have just <laughs> been rubbish. And no one else but him could have done this at this time, I don't think. It's really, really accomplished work. Yeah, I think structurally Titanic split into two pretty distinct parts. There's the first half, the love story, <laughs> and the second half... No, no pun intended. A disaster movie. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and more ways than one, yeah. <laughs> so they're not even the same genres. I'm going to talk more about how I think Cameron handles those two genres in the writing in the highlight sections. For now, I want to talk about the scale and the innovations that Cameron brought to the film. I mean, the budget was $200 million. Like you said there, Westy, Cameron makes sure every penny is put on the screen to show us things that we've not seen before. Because if you're not really breaking new ground, what's the point? He loves a submarine, JC, and he went on 12 <laughs> dives to the Titanic himself. So those shots of the wreckage that we see aren't digital. That's the real Titanic shot for the film, which is impressive. It's ridiculous. 2.5 miles down, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 400 atmospheres. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then to create the ship in 1912, the production design and the effects work, it's incredible. The shots of the ship in dock in Southampton, that was a combination of scale models, matte paintings and forced perspective. It all looks mm-hmm. totally real. Yeah. The ship's interior sets were very detailed. The dining room is exactly what it was like on the ship. We see the gymnasium in one scene and the grand staircase area. I think that's especially memorable. Again, an exact replica of how it looked on the Titanic. Doesn't this look great? Astonishing attention yeah. to detail. A 30 foot scale model of the ship was built, as well as a full life size set of the ship, which is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> They only finished the starboard side, so when shooting on the port side, they had to set it up backwards and then flip the film in post, yeah. like we do with you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why I call it anything branded. <laughs> <laughs> and they could detach the stern on that life-size set and revolve it 90 degrees, and that was used for the end when the ship sinks and goes vertical. Mental, that. And James Kubrick, yeah. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and Cameron's very own effects studio, Digital Domain, they did a lot of CGI work as well. That amazing shot where we move down the entire ship from the bow to the stern, that's their handiwork. Yeah. Looks fantastic. I mean, yeah. doesn't mess about Iron Jim, does he? Not at all. No. The scale no. is jaw-dropping. That's a huge part of the success of the film. And that ambition, that's entirely down to Cameron. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And Matt? What about you and I and Jim on this one? I think it's Cameron boiled down to his essence because there's two elements that really stand out. First one, the technical mastery of the sinking because in terms of working on an epic scale, nothing daunts him. It's what he does best. And I just love those massive pans along the sheer size of the ship once yeah, it's beginning yeah, to sink amazing. and the people run to the stern. It's incredible. And it always makes me feel really queasy, those shots of the stern sticking out the water because it's just so fundamentally wrong. It shouldn't look like that. And it's paced brilliantly. I know, like, in reality, it's 
just under three hours for the Titanic to sink and Cameron's got to compound that into half the time on screen more or less. Mm. So the way he cuts between everything that's going on inside the ship with Jack and Rose to everything that's going on outside on deck means he can jump forward when he wants to really skillfully. Mm -hmm. And there's a shot when he does that, it always sends a chill down my spine and it's that first wide shot you get of the bow already underwater. That's like a real, oh shit, it, it, this is really happening yeah. at the moment and it's pure attention from then on in. And I also love how he fully commits to the romance, which shouldn't surprise anyone really because, you know, Terminator has a love story at the heart of it. Yeah. Aliens has a love story between a mother and a surrogate daughter. So Cameron, yeah. he's completely at home with that. And for all the stories about him as a person, what he's like to work with, he's a big teddy bear at heart, I think. <laughs> and <laughs> it, 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 it ties in with the pacing because it's about 90 yeah. minutes before the iceberg hits. I don't think it feels like it. I would happily spend more time palling around with Jack and Rose because Cameron would. And he's, he's not impatient to get to the iceberg, which is really important because every time I watch it and the iceberg hits, I get taken aback a little bit. I'm like, oh, shit, yeah, I forgot that was going to happen. So, yeah, for me, this is the essence of, of James Cameron in a film. Nice. Third wheel, like, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, just peeking around the corners, aren't they? Yeah. Like Trying to run away from you. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I mentioned at the top, there's some amazing behind-the-scenes stories to this, and this is one of my favourite. Do you guys know about this one, about the poisoning? What happened? Oh, I go on. Was it PCP or something? It was PCP. Someone mixed PCP into lunch one day, so about 80 people came down ill with it. And yeah. the effects were instant, so the thought, first thought was, oh, maybe it's like seafood poison, until James Cameron looked at Russell Carpenter, who was leading a conga line. <laughs> Catherine Borbach was assistant director, and she was talking to Cameron over walkie-talkie, but looking straight at him, and she tried to stab him with a pen. So Cameron was oh. like, oh, my God, they're all off their heads. He made himself sick, so he wouldn't be too ill with it. And Genius. so he escaped the Westwood and they never caught the culprit. But coming to the city, he thinks like some member of the crew had an argument with someone on the catering staff and the poison the food so the catering would get sacked. Amazing. Right. Off their yeah. heads. Lucky for them, Cameron never caught them. There'd have been 1,518 deaths on the Titanic if he had. <laughs> Just held them under the water in the tank. <laughs> Cameron does make a few cameos in the film too. Have you noticed any? Oh, no, uh, I, I know it's his voice at one point. So, man, let's talk of an iceberg. You see anything? Well, there's actually 12 James Cameron cameos in total, so I'll just go through a couple. Right, Near okay. the start of the film, we see a passenger getting his beard checked for lice when Rose boards the ship. That's James oh, Cameron yeah, yeah. wearing a beard. Wow. Oh, All right. And in the famous scene where Jack draws Rose, we see close-ups of Jack's hands doing the sketch. Yeah, yeah. Those are Cameron's yeah, yeah. hands. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's because Cameron drew all the sketches in Jack's portfolio himself. Including yeah. the one-legged prostitute Jack mentions. <laughs> Is that James Cameron as well? <laughs> <laughs> Drew himself in a mirror. He was left-handed, wasn't he? So they had to, they had to like flip that to make him look right-handed. That's right, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, Cameron had to deal with some pretty major issues during production, as you could probably tell. And he originally told Fox he could make the film for £80 million. And it quickly, gave, <laughs> it quickly became apparent that that was way too conservative an estimate. Which I mean, <laughs> he's probably just going in eighty million there. That'll do to start. Ridiculous. Yeah. So the set constructions became so costly that the budget went up to one hundred and thirty-five million. Wow! Just like that, <laughs> boom. So Fox had to turn to Paramount to put in another sixty-five million, and that's why there's two production companies on it. Which you know, totally understandable. Wow! Expensive taste for Cameron. Platinum, Jim. Really expensive. <laughs> 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 you got many Iron Jim jokes have you got? Oh, loads. <laughs> loads. I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> Iron Kubrick. <laughs> I mean, because it's so expensive, I mean, most expensive film ever made at the time, you'd expect yeah. a lot of obsessive attention to detail, which there is. There's a famous photo, if you, if you research it, of a boy playing with like, um, I think it's like a spinning top type thing mm -hmm. oh, yeah. on deck. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's recreated in the film. And the guy playing the kid's father, that's someone called Don Lynch, and he's a Titanic historian, so I think it's when right. I saw Iron Jim got him in there. Hmm. And right. as well as the main characters, though, Cameron Watt backstories for the extras and spoke to 150 of them individually about their backstories. Wow, it's um, it's really tiny, hired, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and he hired the original carpet makers to recreate the, the carpets at the time, thing with the uh, BMK Stoddart, I think they were called. Yeah. yeah, that was a company 80 years later. He wasn't like bullying some 100 year old man to make him some carpets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although, who knows? You know what? <laughs> Would not have surprised me if he had done that. Come on, out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Come on, Grandad, make a carpet. <laughs> Best of all, though, you know how the runtime of the film is three hours and 14 minutes? Yeah. yeah. Well, all the 1912 sequences together, that's two hours and 40 minutes of the runtime. 
two hours and 40 minutes is how long it took for the Titanic to actually sink. Amazing. Wow. That's insane, that. Yeah, I remember the film was so long that when it came out on VHS, it was across two tapes. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, it used to go off, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I believe you may get your headlines, Mr. Ismay. Massive pain in the arse having to get up and twitch tapes there. <laughs> yeah, it was oh. awful. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I know as well that the extra pressure from the production problems sent Cameron into Iron Jim Overdrive on the set. <laughs> When they were shooting the lifeboat scenes, Cameron threatened to fire anybody who asked for a bathroom break once they were in the water. And this led to some mm. of the actors just pissing their own pants, yeah. which is disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What else are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I pissed myself outside of water yeah. against Cameron told us. Yeah. I couldn't go to the toilet. <laughs> Fine. It's in the street. <laughs> also, Cameron wouldn't let Kate Winslet wear a wetsuit, and she caught hypothermia. And shooting the scene where Jack and Rose are locked behind the iron gate... Winslet's coat mm-hmm, got yeah. caught and she was underwater for more than a minute. She was pretty distressed naturally when she came up and Cameron just said, okay, can you do one more? And she was furious <laughs> and she later said, you'd have to pay me an awful lot of money to work with James Cameron again. Yeah. And because of the budget overruns, Fox told Cameron that he had to lose an hour from the film. Cameron refused, obviously, and apparently said, yeah. you want to cut my movie? You're going to have to fire me. You want to fire me? You're going to have to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> he's fucking great isn't he oh, I love the guy I, I he's love amazing him. I love him <laughs> brilliant and another thing about this as well is that James Horner came to Cameron and just had this theme tune and then he said I'll, I'll, I'll just sort it out Cameron's like yeah sort it out you know I've got Celine Dion to sing it he said oh she's quite big yeah that, that should be alright Celine Dion didn't like the song at all Will Jennings wrote the lyrics based on the melody that's actually in the music right and the right. music of this film absolutely is nailed on. There's this in Braveheart by Horner, which I think yeah. is just incredible mm. scores. It was one of the biggest selling scores of all time at the at the mm. time when it yeah, came yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic, amazing, amazing pieces of music. And Celine Dion went in, and it was her first take. So what you hear on the soundtrack, on the radio, everywhere else, that was her. She just went in and did it once because she didn't want to do it. Wow. Wow. And it was that big. Cameron heard it. He's like, right, I'll put it on the end credits. And that, you know, just went absolutely... Huge. It was massive, that song, wasn't it? At the time. Yeah, yeah it was everywhere. So, was everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Well, after all that, to say Titanic was a hit would be an understatement. We mentioned it was the highest grossing movie ever made, and it also won 11 Oscars, including Best Picture and Best Director for Cameron. Peter Lamont for Titanic. James Horner and Will Jennings for My Heart Will Go On. James Horner, Titanic. Deborah L. Scott for Titanic. Russell Carpenter for Titanic. Titanic. They'd be too scared to give it to anybody else, I'd imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> imagine. I'm accepting this on behalf of James Cameron. <laughs> Just yeah. give it <laughs> Yeah, you would do. <laughs> Only two other films have ever won 11 Oscars. Do you know what they are? Uh... Um, Lord of the Rings, Return of the Kings. That Return one. of the Kings won. Oh, I'll yeah. just leave this to you. <laughs> the, other one know, the other one was Ben Hur. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Cameron, the director of Titanic, then, big challenge, but pulled it off, we think. Out of the With park. These. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As he has done with pretty much all of his films, Cameron didn't just direct Titanic, he wrote the screenplay as well. Mm -hmm. So how is the writing on Titanic, Matt? Well, what was it? 14 Oscar nominations, but not for the writing, which does tell its own story, (laughs) I think, to some extent. (laughs) It works for me on the most important level, which is Jack and Rose and their story. I might be on my own in that. We'll see. I suspect, you know, at least one of you is going to have something, a different take (laughs) on that. But I do buy that. What I would say, though, outside of that, everything starts to fall apart a little bit. You know, all those little jokes that Cal has about Picasso. Picasso, he won't amount to a thing. Oh, yeah. They fall quite flat. <laughs> Freud, what is he, a passenger? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's not as funny or as clever as he thinks he is, and I think... He fucking is, like... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he, he thinks he's being satirical like when Rose's mother asks if the lifeboat's going to be seeded according to class now I don't know it's possible someone did say that it just feels a bit clunky but the biggest issue I do have is the very broad character writing outside of the two main characters so yeah. pretty much all the English characters are incredible snobs and that scene where Guggenheim dresses up in his evening attire mm-hmm. we are dressed in our best and are prepared to go down as gentlemen that did happen that's what he said yeah. 
But the way Cameron has written it, it makes him look like an idiot, mm. you know, asking for a glass of brandy like he doesn't understand the seriousness of it. And so there's someone who, by all accounts, he just knew he wasn't going to get out of this situation and he made his end with real bravery. And it's the same with the, the Irish characters. Like, again, I'm not disputing in third class. It was probably quite rowdy and they would have parties. But, you know, arm wrestling, dancing the Kaylee, probably got the cause in the background somewhere. <laughs> you know, it is written like a bad Guinness advert. I would so worst example for me, though, is Fabrizio, Jack's best mate. He is the worst Italian I've ever seen. <laughs> I could see the Statue of Liberty already. I go to America. <laughs> it's a me. It's a Mario. <laughs> I go get the pasta. Yeah, it's it's like, like an American tale, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's like, that's exactly what it's like. It's like on that scene in Glorious Bastards where they all do an Italian accent. <laughs> Margarete. Un'altra volta, ma adesso vorrei proprio sentire la musica delle parole. I can see the Statue of Liberty already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a bond for you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It like the performance is okay, but the writing of Fabrizio really lets him down. And overall for me, that's the issue with the writing in the film. Like Cameron, he nails the heart of it, I think. I think everything outside of it, he needed some help. Mm. Yeah, I mean here's the thing for me. Cameron at his best mm. is an action filmmaker. Here he's mostly yeah. writing a love story. Instead of Romeo and Juliet, we get Rose and Jack. And the mm-hmm. writing of that first half of the film is the poorest aspect of the film for me. Mm-hmm. As an action right. writer, Cameron has fantastic sensibilities. Aliens, especially the character of Ripley, is the best written action film ever, for my money. Writing a love story, though, those sensibilities and Cameron's feel aren't as strong. I don't think it comes as naturally to him. And as a result, I think he falls back on cliches and tropes. And the writing here is pretty thin for me. I mean, some of the dialogue is dreadful. Like the scene when they're in the car and Jack jumps in the driver's seat. Where to, miss? To the stars. That's nothing dialogue. <laughs> it's as wooden as the door that Rose floats on. <laughs> or the famous iconic scene where they're on the bow of the ship. I'm flying, Jack. Yeah, oh, yeah, where's well. the iceberg? <laughs> when you need it. <laughs> My biggest problem, though, isn't the dialogue. It's that the characters are too black and white for me. I mean, look at Carl, the villain. There's little subtlety, mm. little realism there. He's a frothing at the mouth psychopath, turning over tables, chasing them with a gun when the <laughs> ship's sinking. He's like an action movie yeah. villain, because that's how you do yeah. it in an action film. You don't have as long to develop yeah. the characters. Yeah, though, Cameron's got almost two hours to do that, but the characters are still drawn very broadly. A good love story to me is two people who are flawed, troubled, but perfect for each other. Jack and Rose are just perfect all of the time. I mean, Rose, mm-hmm. unaffected by class, life and soul, the party, she's dancing, she's necking pints, she's Little Miss Perfect. Mm-hmm. Jack, an amazing artist, he's brave as a lion, he's wise beyond his years, he's Peter Perfect. I mean, the artist thing I do like, that's obviously based on Cameron, he's a great illustrator mm-hmm. himself. He should have put more of himself in there. I and Jack, that would have been great. <laughs> oh God, that's another one. Let's have a little meet, it's like, bing, like all the iron, iron cards. <laughs> <laughs> but to sum up, my problem is that the real life story, which is a story of class, capitalist greed, heroism, tragedy, and more than that, has been put on the back burner in favour of a fictional story that skims those themes but has little depth. If the Atlantic had been as shallow as the love story, the Titanic would have never had a problem. And that's my biggest problem with the Very film. Very nice. <laughs> mm. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And Westy, you're going to disagree with everything I've just said there, I think, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think this is a masterpiece of the screen, but no. Um, it's very much to me that he knows the spectacle is going to be good enough so he can put anyone on board. And it is very broad strokes for the characters. All he needs to do is introduce a little bit of tragedy hmm. and you're, you're going to cry your eyes out because it's, it is, it, it's a tragedy in itself. Yeah, It's already sad. And I think... It's really, it, it stands out, not necessarily on the Titanic bits, because you can kind of go, oh, well, maybe people did act like that or they did speak like that, and it's just, it is its own kind of universe on there, and that's fine. But when it's a modern day, you know, the start of the film to the end of the film that's bookended, with Bill Paxton in there, and I think Bill Paxton primarily just plays James Cameron. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you've got everyone who's his sidekick, and they're all just cliched, you know, the guy with the VR, he's a fat guy, he was games yeah. workshop, he's just Looks like, like yeah, Harry Knowles. she's full of shit, you know, and he's, he's just, yeah, he, he's, he just binge watches Black Mirror, like, every month, so he's got, you've got that. <laughs> Didn't you do that last month? That sounds like you, Wesley, yeah. games workshop. <laughs> that would be me. But no, it's them, it's them 
scenes that bookend them, they don't really make much sense and they are drawn out to just say, look yeah. what I've done. Look at the Titanic. Look at this. It's just like that person in the picture is me. I kind of like that. But honestly, you could have condensed both of them sequences. But the writing of the end of the film is outrageous. It's just like he's just mortal, just going, ah! It's <laughs> <laughs> on so the PCP by that point. She dies at the end. I want to see her flatline. I want to know she's dead. Before that, right, she goes in, she's got the heart of the ocean her whole life. You know how much that's worth? You know what she could have done with that money? A million, Do you know yeah. how much of a life she could have? <laughs> millions, yeah. right? So she keeps it a whole life and then hides it. In the, ooh, yeah. too romantic. Yeah, what are your kids? Yeah, yeah. well, exactly. What <laughs> are your grandkids? And she's just, just fannying about and just throws it away. It's like it doesn't really have that resonance for me yeah. because that would be pissing on Carol more than it would be on Jack, so yeah. get rid of it. Yeah. It's a real twist that she could have lived the best life after she just sold that and yeah. sold that whole life. I think that would have been amazing. A hundred year old feet? Don't want to see them. Disgusting, right? That's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then she goes back to the Titanic. The doors open, everyone's there. Did they have to do that with everyone who died? Does everyone yeah, just go nice. back there? Yeah. <laughs> fucking round of applause. Yeah. You're in heaven now, Sam. That, that seems like if I died on the Titanic and had to welcome everyone back who'd survived and had a mint life, I'd be fucking furious, yeah. right? I'm not standing there. Well, when people back after the band, oh, you've days to love your life, right? And that's another thing. She got married. She had kids with a guy. As soon as she dies, she goes back to Jack. Where's her husband? Yeah, Where yeah, is he? Yeah. He'd be yeah, sitting yeah. there fucking furious. <laughs> Wait, he's already dead. Right here. Our oh, lass is coming, everyone. Right near by that. Wait, where is she gone? Oh, she's on the Titanic, mate. She's with that Jack fella. Oh, when I watched it again and it got to me and I was thinking, I actually bought this when I first saw it and it was great and it all ties together, but you can see the holes in it are as big as the holes in Titanic itself, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I know like you wanted more real-life people in there, John Lord, alongside the obviously fictional Jack Moss, but there is lots in there. You've got most of the crew, for example, so Bernard Hill, he's Captain Smith. Obviously, he was the real captain. You've got Johnny Phillips, he plays uh, Charles Lightoller. Uh, mm-hmm. Ewan Stewart plays William Murdoch, and Murdoch is the guy, he's the officer, sorry, who shoots himself on deck yeah. after he accidentally yes. kills uh, Tommy. No, Will! And there are reports that an officer did do this, but no one can say for certain who. Yeah, William Murdoch's family demanded an apology from Cameron when the film came out because of that. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. I mean, yeah, I remember that happening. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You want an apology? You're going to have to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot him instead. Uh, I think maybe the most famous one was Margaret Brown, who is Kathy Bates' character. Kathy Bates, yeah. She's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, she's great. Kathy Bates is, well, she's always great. Yeah, she is, to be fair. Like, but yeah, she got that nickname, didn't she? The unsinkable Molly Brown. And that's because she made her lifeboat go back and pick up more of the, the, the passengers who were still in the water. What's the matter with you? It's your men out there. Yeah, there was a musical made about her in the 50s. I mean, talk about inappropriate. Song and dance routines on the Titanic. Yeah, Debbie Reynolds played her. Oh, really? I thought you were building up to another iron joke there. (laughs) (laughs) Iron Debbie? Iron Debbie, that'll do, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Debbie does iron. (laughs) Uh, Oh. (laughs) I'm too far. (laughs) Too far. (laughs) Um, yeah, also, though, you've got Ismay in there. He was the, the real-life MD of White Star Line. So he's the guy who actually owns Titanic. And mm-hmm. famously, he's the one you see sneaking onto the lifeboat. The little weasel that he is with women yeah. and children. Yeah, yeah, he was vilified in the press at the time for saving mm-hmm. himself while women and children were still aboard. There's a deleted scene from Titanic as well where the survivors give him loads of dirty looks on the deck of the Carpathia, which is the rescue ship. All right. Yeah, that's why. Right. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, well, well deserved. Mm-hmm. Um one of my favourite performers though, is Victor Garber, who plays Thomas Andrews. And he's, he's the guy who yeah. built... Yeah, he's really good. Really like him in this. He's the guy who built Titanic. Yeah. Um, and famously, the last time you see him in the film is when he's correcting the clock in the smoking room yeah. before the ship yeah. goes down. But apparently in real life, he was out on deck handing out life jackets when the ship went down. Mm. Oh, right. Yeah, there's so many incredible stories. One of my favourites is about a couple called Ida and Isidore Strauss. They were the owners mm-hmm. of Macy's, the New York department store. And Isidore was offered a place on a lifeboat, but said no because there were still women and children on board. Because he said mm-hmm. no, Ida said no. We see a shot of them in the film as well. It's the well-dressed older couple hugging, lying on the bed. On the bed. As the ship yeah, sinks. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, right. That's yes. all the water okay. underneath them. Yeah, it's yeah, great, yeah, that yeah. shot. So rich yeah. people, not always bastards, as it turns out. No. <laughs> as no. it turns out. What a working class <laughs> point of view. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, there was one other famous film, wasn't there? A Night to Remember, that was made about Titanic, oh, yeah. which was yeah. made earlier on. And Cameron took a lot of inspiration from that. And there were some scenes that he, he took directly from it, like Andrew's telling Captain Smith that the ship's sinking is uh, mathematical certainty. It's it's mathematical certainty. certainty. That's crushing that, like, yeah, it's like, yeah, that it's, like that's it, you, you're yeah. done for. Mm, yeah. uh, the Titanic's band preparing to leave, only to come back together to carry on playing. Mm. And the tune that the player is near, am I God to thee? Which is, that's a beautiful thing. Well, yeah. it should have been like, imagine if it was like Cotton Eye Joe or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, near am I God to thee? It's a bit miserable, isn't it? <laughs> when everyone oh, knows cheers, that. lads. <laughs> <laughs> Just need a bit of a boost. Yeah. Like, Don't stop yeah. me now by Queen or yeah. something. Yeah. Should have got Molly Brown in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, apparently that was played on the ship. So, you know, no wonder so many people gave up. Um, and the shot of his mate and the lifeboat as the Titanic sinks behind him, yeah. which is lifted from that. And the scene where they come across Andrews looking at the painting as Titanic starts to sink. Yeah. That was, that was lifted yeah. from that as well. So a fair few, a little bit of a homage. Yeah, that's a great set with the tilting set when Andrews is looking at the painting. Yeah, yeah with the Dutch yeah, angle. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah. The writing on Titanic then seems to be a bit of a mixed bag to us. Lots of good stuff, but the love story, yeah, yeah. a load of old soppy nonsense. <laughs> yeah, he needed a hand. He needed, you know. <laughs> soppy nonsense. <laughs> Titanic is a love story at its core, and the actors in the two leads are among the most acclaimed of their generation. Mm-hmm. So, which are you going to talk about, Matt? I'm going to talk about Kate Winslet and her massive hat. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Didn't know where that was going. Yeah, I left a pause for you. I wanted to see the worry in your eyes. That beat should have been longer, mate. You had that, you've wasted that opportunity. <laughs> it's the type of performance where you watch it, you think that is someone becoming a star in front of your very eyes. Because yeah. she hadn't done that much before this. Maybe Sense and Sensibility was the biggest thing. Yeah. But she completely shoulders this film and carries this huge three-hour epic with just, like, no bother at all. And she's only 21 when she made this, and she's a smart woman as well, so she will know what Cameron's reputation was like as a hard taskmaster. But it doesn't seem to daunt her at all. I think she just threw herself into it, and certainly from what I can tell, no complaints, no diva behaviour, just complete confidence in herself. And to be honest, like, a real bravery, considering how physically demanding this shoot was, and she just got on with it. And, you know, Cameron, famously good at creating strong female protagonists, Mm -hmm. Rose is not different, really engaging character, but not overwritten. So she is smart, she is tough. She can stand up to Cal and her mother every now and then, but she's not thrown out like sassy one-liners in every scene. She's just very relatable, very believable. Brave when the situation calls for it. I love her when she goes back in the flooded corridors to save Jack. That's a great scene. Yeah. But also vulnerable. You see how terrified she is when the ship is finally going down. And she's funny, you know, you mentioned that scene, John, where she's at the party and she's, you know, she's necking the pint, standing on her toes, you know, standing up to the guys. That's great. So, yeah, brilliant. And I do think her and DiCaprio together, they deserve a lot of credit for making this film work because you've got to really believe in them as characters and they've got to be the heart of the film. They've got to be the reason you're happy to come back to watch this film again and again before the iceberg hits. They've got to make that bit work in the do and that's down to the performances so for me it's still one of my favorite Winslet performances and what I love though is that after she found out she had to be naked in front of DiCaprio at one point she actually flashed him when they first met to break the ice yeah (laughs) that was the first scene the shot wasn't it yeah 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 right (laughs) yeah 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 I mean I was a bit critical of the character writing before and I think what saves Cameron is that he has two great actors in those roles Mm. I mean no surprise Mm. that Kate Winslet is very good but it's interesting that she also had a hand in some of Rose's character moments it was her who yeah. came up with the line when Rose and Jack are on the bow of the ship as it sinks, and she says, This is where we first met. Oh, it's a heartbreak, oh, right. that. It's the yeah. best bit of dialogue in the whole film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Winslet came up with the idea of Rose spitting in Carl's face to get away from him, yeah. which it has to be that. Oh, class. Yeah. 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 Cameron should let her write more of the script, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, should have done. So, this was the first film to be nominated for two acting Oscars for the same character. Winslet was nominated for Best Actress, and Gloria Stewart, who plays Old Rose, was nominated for Best Support and Actress. Right. Yeah, Gloria Stewart's really good. The other Rose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was really eager for the role as well. She was sending notes to Cameron on a daily basis. Even flew out to LA to track him down for, like, a personal meet. And she was phoning him as well and just leaving him voice messages. You know, why haven't you cast me yet? You know, demanding (laughs) to know why. And then, obviously, he eventually did. So when he did, uh, she sent him a rose with a message from your rose. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Class <laughs> yeah. She should have wrote, I'm flying, Jim. 
she hadn't read the script but there's no way she would have thought of that there's okay. nobody would have thought of that <laughs> alright then Kate wins are very good and Westy looks like you're left yeah. with LDC LDC the main man he's great in this He's very good as Jack. It, it's almost like a kind of role model for that kind of age where you just want to be footloose and fancy free, cool looking guy. His hair was great at the time. You know, his yeah. clothes are just kind of ramshackled together. He just borrows coats. He's just <laughs> great. And he's just, you know, on the tabs, bumming tabs off people. And even when he's in a really pressurised situation, when he's at dinner with them, the way... Oh, it's amazing. Well, his favourite bit when he just throws the matches to Cal. There you go, Cal. Yeah. And he just gets it and then he throws it back. I think that's just a really lovely little moment. Mm. And his character is believable because you would believe DiCaprio has had this kind of a life. And what he brings to this is, is so close to just being, you know, the DiCaprio fever, the poster boy thing. It is a real role model for, you know, for especially for my son. I'm going to show him someone like that and say, you know, that's how you treat people. That's how you respect people. That's how you treat women. That's how, you know, mm. that's how you behave. Even if you're in a situation where people are getting the better of you, don't rise to anything. You know, and he never steals anything. There's no violence. And on the page, Jack should be so fucking annoying. I'm the king of the world! <laughs> and I think the chemistry that they both have throughout this film, I mean, they've been very, very good friends ever since. And every time you see them together, you just get like a little warm sensation when they just meet yeah. at the Oscars or something and you see them both together and you're like, Winslet brought her A game and so did DiCaprio. They knew exactly what they were doing and they gave it absolutely everything, even though they both hate the performances in there. Because Capri was like, I was just a spoiled little kid and Winslet mm. said her accent wasn't as good as it should have been. And he was responsible for me buying so many hair products at the time <laughs> in 97. <laughs> <laughs> just brushing it up. This, constant, this, this, this clunk of side hair. Walking out, braces on. Fucking yes, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think with a lesser actor, Jack could have been awful. He's brilliant mm. at everything for no reason. I mean, when the ship's yeah. sinking, no one knows what to do. The crew doesn't know what to do. The captain doesn't know what to do. But Jack knows what to do. He knows what to do, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he knows how to get out of handcuffs. Yeah, he knows how to hold an axe. He's dancing, though. He's dancing's pretty shit. But he, he's oh, there and he does yeah. all that. Yeah. That's shit. That's not impressive. I would have left immediately if I was for rules. I'd be like, oh, he looks a bit like he's, his knees are disjointed or something. What's wrong with you? Yeah, but DiCaprio is really good. He mostly redeems Jack, but there were lots of famous names considered before DiCaprio. Yeah. So Johnny Depp, Brad Pitt, yes. and Ethan Hawke were considered. They kind of make sense, but what about this one? Macaulay Culkin as Jack? Macaulay <laughs> When it hits the iceberg, it's the iceberg and he's like, ah! <laughs> Just hitting Cal with a big paint can. Yeah, that would be fucking mint. Loads of booby traps everywhere. <laughs> I would love to have something else to reference Macaulay Culkin do, but there's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing. No, it's so, home loan and that's yeah, it. You stick with home loan, mate. <laughs> and the thing is, I mean, I love DiCaprio on this, but he was reluctant to do it originally because it hadn't been that long since he didn't run on Juliet and he didn't want to be typecast as that, like, yes. doomed, oh, like, yeah, tragic, that romantic true. lead. But yeah. Winslet apparently cornered him in a hotel room and <laughs> persuaded him to do it. Any need for this? <laughs> well, it's just, you know, <laughs> just, just cornering him in a hotel room. Just weird of them. Yeah. She could have gone me in a yeah. hotel room. That'd be fine. <laughs> Leo and Kate then, can't fault them really. Pretty iconic as Jack and Rose. Yeah. Yeah, Very totally so. carry the film and, and rightly so. Yeah. Picking out three highlights for Titanic wasn't particularly difficult. The challenge was finding ones that came before the iceberg shows up. Yeah. Matt, I think you might have just done it, though. What's your highlight? I have. I do think it's important to talk about the film before the iceberg hits. Yeah, the first VHS. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the first part. The part that's probably not quite as worn out as the second one. Yeah, exactly. a lot of people. <laughs> but no. I am going to talk about Jack Saving Rose when he uh, stops to throw herself off the CERN. Because, yeah, okay... It's melodramatic as hell, but this is what I mean by Cameron's direction. He just commits to it. He doesn't care that it's melodramatic. Yeah. And by the end, I'm fully on board. So is Rose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I di I didn't viewers, I didn't even set Wesley up on that. That was amazing. 
But mention it already, that chemistry between DiCaprio and Winslet, it's instantaneous because they've yeah. both been introduced, they've been good characters so far, but put them together for the first time and it's just so tangible, the way they yeah. spark off each other. Love the way he says, No, you won't. But he's got that little bit of doubt in his voice when she says yeah. she's going to jump and the way she's arsy with him in return, you know. What do you mean, no, I won't? Don't presume to tell me what I will and will not do. You don't know me. Tells you everything you need to know about them straight away. And then she says he's distracting her. So he knows she doesn't really want to do it, but he's got to play it so carefully. He's got to put that little bit of guilt on her. You know, well, I'll have to go in after you and I'm probably going to die if I do. You know, it's just played really carefully. Like Lethal Weapon. You really are crazy. (laughs) Yes, very much so. (laughs) But it, it's funny as well. I love her when she gets really annoyed when he tries to mansplain what ice fishing is to her. Ice fishing is, you know where you... I know what ice fishing is. In that expression yeah. on his face, like, sorry, really funny. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I get the end of the scene, I think, yeah, okay, you know what? I could have lived without her slipping and nearly falling. That's like a cliffhanger from a 1930s serial, you know, yeah. the perils of Pauline, whatever they were called. And I think him <laughs> describing how cold the water is, that's a bit obvious in terms of foreshadowing. But by the end, the most important thing is I'm hooked I'm just totally invested in both of these characters and I want to know what happens next and I think if this scene doesn't work the rest of the film doesn't work yeah yeah I think my only problem is that there are two instances in the film where Jack gets arrested for a crime he didn't commit after this he gets framed by Lovejoy yeah. for stealing the necklace I mean mix oh, up yeah, a bit yeah. surely <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My highlight, I'm going for maybe the key point in the film, the Titanic hits the iceberg. It's got a hit! So Jack and Rose come out on deck after being chased by Lovejoy. We move up to the crow's nest, the lookout sees the iceberg, and like that, everything changes. All of a yeah. sudden there's a ticking clock. We're in a disaster mm. movie. I mean, this is Cameron in his wheelhouse, and it's some yeah. sight. Instantly, the quality of the filmmaking goes up about three notches for me. The whole sequence <laughs> yeah. is exceptional. The lookout spot in the iceberg, the first officer Murdoch shouting at the helmsman. Oh, the starboard, starboard. The engine room going into reverse, and then tension, waiting to see if they're going to hit the iceberg. I think one of the reasons it's so powerful is because it's based on reality. When the lookout radios down to the bridge and says, Iceberg, right ahead! Those are the real words that were said at the time. And yeah. they really did put the ship into reverse, like in the film. That was the wrong decision, and it cost 1,500 lives. But going yeah. through the ship to see how the impact was felt from first class, where it's barely a rumble, through third class, who mm. feel it more strongly, to the point of impact where the water's bursting through the hull, and then the boiler room where the watertight doors are coming down. It's genuinely yeah. thrilling filmmaking. Yeah, it is. And when you yeah. know this is basically how it all happened as well, I think it's pretty terrifying. It's mm-hmm. Cameron yeah. at his best, it's brilliant, and it just gets more spectacular from here. Yeah, they did say if the Titanic had hit the iceberg head on, that would have been fine. That's yeah. right, yeah, that's right. Because yeah, like yeah. they say in the film, it needed to go over the first five bulkheads. If they hit head on, yeah. it wouldn't have went over the first five bulkheads, so it would never have sunk. Yeah. yeah. And Wesley, what's your highlight? When it sinks. <laughs> <laughs> everybody dies. <laughs> well, everybody dies. When it's got its big ass in the air. <laughs> and it's, uh... <laughs> no, uh, that bit is it's cinema. That bit when it just starts lifting out the water and that that, Incredible. that sound effect. Yeah. It's got that yeah. rah, terrifying big scale mm. and it's just it's just lit perfectly. Where it's not it's not overly it's supposed to be dark, but it's not overly dark. You can kind of see mm. everything, the way the water's coming off it. And then the just the reactions between Rose and Jack. I mean, for Jack to know, oh, I'll have to climb over. I'll be, I'll be dead, mate, easily. <laughs> you don't need, oh, I'll need to climb over this one. So then, you know, the water's going to suck me down. So yeah. take a deep breath. Like, I wouldn't yeah. have a clue about that. <laughs> yeah. I would just be going, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> but that's great. And you've got that really great line of dialogue where it's just, you know, this is where we first met. It's just great. I mean, I know there was 150 extras in this, 100 stunt performers. <laughs> Okay, 
and the people that you see kind of like hitting the the railings going down and kind yeah. of sliding down it's just really really visceral and re it's real because it's not necessarily cgi it's just done physically mm -hmm. and camera knows to do that and make it proper but when i watch this with the kids they're like oh is it sinking yeah i'm like yeah and the need to see the bit where the guy falls off hits the propeller and spins because yeah. they just think yeah. that's the best thing in the world <laughs> And then when it finally goes down and you've just got this right, this is the moment, like, what's going to happen? It's just so impactful, just that when it splits in half and then from that to that final sink and it's just masterfully done. It's it's like you're watching it happen. And I think this yeah. is this is the scene that Cameron was like, this is why I'm making this film. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it still stands up. This has got 100% of his attention mm. and it, you can so tell. Like, when he's committed to something, this is how yeah. good it is. Yeah. And it's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, we can talk about Ian Jim or Leo and Kate, but the reason we're all here is to see that guy jump off the ship and hit the propeller on the way down. Ah! Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course, everyone loves that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Again, though, the behind-the-scenes footage is outrageous. Shot from Mexico, where they sank the life-size set they built. And when you compare this to previous Titanic films, where the ship sort of gracefully slides below the waves, this is yeah. chaos. Yeah. There's yeah. a moment here as well when the stern's pointing up out the water and the lights all go out. Cameron hasn't oh, yeah. cut out at the precise Terrifying moment that. that they did in real life, according to witnesses. Although mm -hmm. in real life, it was 2.17 in the morning. And the survivors say that when the lights went out, you literally couldn't see a thing in front of you. So this was all mm. happening in pitch black, which is just terrifying. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> hearing it. Yeah. Christ. And as well, we've already mentioned a lot of the real life figures on board the mm -hmm. Titanic. There is another one here. You know that guy who is beside Jack and Rose on the CERN and like the chef's whites swinging on the hip flask as he yeah, goes yeah. down. He was he was a real, he was the chief baker on Titanic, <laughs> a, um, a guy called Charles Droffin, and that's how he generally went into the water on top of the stern. And he survived as well, he said, for Did two he? hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Trod water for two hours, just clinging on a debris, and he reckons Jeez. the reason he survived was because he was drunk, he'd been necking that whiskey, so the <laughs> alcohol <laughs> kept him warm. Mr. Poppin' yeah. Fresh. Didn't yeah, yeah. Mr. Poppin' Fresh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even more amazing, you know, that was the second time he'd survived a shipwreck. <laughs> Jesus. Can you imagine? Second time, Jonah for that guy. Just, yeah. <laughs> Uncle Albert. During the war. Oh, God, look at the time. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Just floating on a massive baguette. During the war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, we should have had on there, you know, when it goes up and it snaps it off just before it snaps in half. You should yeah. have had Brian Glover on there just go, it's still too heavy. <laughs> and then it snaps. <laughs> that would have been amazing. <laughs> and when the ship's sinking, there's a scene next to the grand staircase where water starts to pour in from all sides and from above. Mm. They released yeah. 120 tonnes of water to shoot that. It's one of those moments where behind the scenes footage is as impressive as what we see in the film. Not bad. Yeah, Cameron's yeah. there as well, looking furious. Oh, <laughs> water wasn't going fast enough for us, and yeah. probably wasn't enough of it. And they only had one shot of that as well, didn't yeah. they? Because, like we said, everything's authentic, carpets, mm. everything. Yeah. So once that's done, it's done. Yeah. And also in that scene, you've, you have Eric Braden, who plays John Jacob Astor, who at the time, and he did die on Titanic, but at the time, he's one of the richest men in the world. And Braden said, filming that scene was the most terrifying moment of his life, which is, you know, understandable. Wow. Well, yeah. Imagine being there in the middle of the Atlantic, how terrifying it would be. <laughs> in pitch black. <laughs> yeah. We haven't covered um, a lot of things that people actually talk about. The first one is the door that Kate Winslet is on, that Rose is on, and Jack doesn't get on. And people right. keep talking about, he should have got on, she just let him die, right? It's not a question <laughs> of surface area, it's a question of buoyancy. He tries to get on, and they're both too heavy, right? So they're both too, so it sinks, so he gets off. Yeah. That's done. That's finished. Yeah. There's no more discussion with that. The internet. So that's finished, right? It's going to sink. It's too heavy. Stay on it. Stay on, Rose. Oh, three highlights then. Jack saving Rose is a good scene, but I think it's mostly mm -hmm. about the iceberg and the aftermath. And the hour and a half it takes the ship to sink is exceptional from Cameron. Oh, yeah. Really unbelievable. Done. Matt, this was your choice, so you first, please. Mm -hmm. Your summary and score for Titanic. Yep. Titanic, yes, it's corny at times. Yes, at times, awfully melodramatic. And yes, the only thing Billy Zane is missing is a tash to twirl and a train track to tie <laughs> Kate Winston to. <laughs> but I don't care. You know, yeah, the writing isn't great, but Cameron just goes for it to 100%, and he sweeps me along with it. DiCaprio wins it perfectly, casting every little bit of cynicism I potentially have just gets squashed out of me when I watch this. I love disaster movies. This is one of the very best. 
this is, you know, for me, it's Aliens, Terminator, Titanic. Wow. So it's a nine. Oof. Wow. Okay. Nice. Mm. For me, like I mentioned at the start, the first time I saw Titanic, I liked it, but was disappointed that what I thought was a missed opportunity, telling a fictional love story instead of tapping into the weight of the real life stories. And mm. coming back to it now, a lot of years later, I kind of feel the same, to be honest. Right. right. For anyone that's interested, there's a two-part documentary called Death of the Dream and the Legend Lives On about the real events and the real people of the Titanic. Watch that, yeah. and I think people might see what I mean, because this could right. have been up there with, I think, Schindler's List is one of Hollywood's great historical documents commenting on right, class, right. capitalism, honour, dishonour, and lots more to a backdrop of one of the most talked about events of the 20th century. Instead, the first half, I find too thin. The tone's a bit secretly sweet at times, and I don't really mm. believe in the two main characters. I think if Cameron had based the first half on reality, explored those themes I mentioned, I'd done it to a level anywhere near the action sequences, which are sensational, this could have been his yeah. masterpiece. Balancing right. that all out, I'd be coming in around a 7 or 7.5 out of 10, but throwing in the unprecedented success, commercial and awards base of the film, I'm going to give it a little bit more, and I'm going to give Titanic 8 out of 10. Okay. And Westy, to finish us off, your summary and score for Titanic, please. Yeah, I mean, well, I've had a lot to say about it as we've gone through it. I mean, I do enjoy it. I do enjoy coming back to it. My kids enjoy it. I think it's a really great film. It, you know, it, it covers a lot of bases, but it does have a lot of issues with it that aren't, doesn't make it enjoyable to sit through three hours and 20 minutes consistently over and over again. I kind of, I'll skip the start. I'll watch the middle bit. I'll skip a little bit of that. Then I'll watch the sinking and then I'll skip the end. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. that, to me, is not a cohesive mm -hmm. film, but it's all there. It's all great. And I loved it when I first saw it, and I think everyone had to see it more than once, and that's down to Cameron's filmmaking, which is astonishing. The acting's really, really good. The writing kind of lets it down. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's not a perfect film by any stretch, but it is very enjoyable, so it's an 8 out of 10 for me. Very nice. So mm -hmm. overall, that leaves Titanic with a score of 25 out of 30. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's it for this episode. If you like what we do here, you can help us out and access bonus episodes by supporting us on Patreon. You can also get access to over 200 hours worth of All The Right Movies podcasts and lots more benefits too. And you can get those podcasts on our website. So please head there now to have a look. Yes, please yes. do. Yes, please do. But for now, I would say never let go, but that's far too sloppy. <laughs> I'll let Matt say that. I'll just say <laughs> so long and thanks for watching. <laughs> There's a boat, Matt. <laughs> Never let go. <laughs> like ET. <laughs> <laughs>